I don't know. All right, so this is the next chapter, right? So chapter 12 um, for our next module, so not on Tuesday's test, right? So we're, we're not going to waste time, though, so we're going to move on. So now we're going to, uh, we've been talking about DNA replication. Now we're going to move on to passing that information forward uh, in the process known as transcription. So remember that DNA, when we look at it, the different regions carry different information. And so the term that we use most often is a gene, right? But what does that actually mean? That's a, a segment of the DNA that actually codes for some functional product, right? Something that does something in the cell. Because remember, DNA is just information, right? It's what we do with the information that really determines what the organism looks like, does, so, uh, so on and so forth. So the most common product that we think of is a polypeptide, or what's another name for a polypeptide? A protein, right? So most of the time, right, we make proteins from that information. And there's a stepwise process in, in which this happens. The first step of it is transcription, right? Most of us at this point, we're aware of this. Um, what people don't realize um, is RNA is actually considered a gene product as well, right? Um, and it's made from the DNA. And that there are more than just messenger RNA, right? There's actually a lot of RNAs. So what transcription literally means is a copy right? A copy of something. And most of you guys write transcripts all the time, right? Someone is speaking, someone's lecturing like myself, and you're writing down your notes. That's considered a transcript, right? Um, it's in the same language, right? So is kind of DNA and RNA in the same molecular or similar molecular language, right? They're both nucleic acids, but as we know, right, from going over the structure, they are slightly different, okay? Um, but it's still the same type of molecule, so you could almost say the same language. So we're making a transcript in the same language. This process doesn't, of course, alter the DNA. It doesn't change it in any way. Again, we're just making a copy of that information. A movable copy, a copy that can go someplace else. So those genes that actually code for a protein are referred to as structural genes, right? Because they make something that, that's structural, right, that you could physically um, see. In order for it to be made into a protein, the first step is this transcription and the making of a special RNA we know as messenger RNA, because it's basically carrying that message. Where is it carrying it to? Where does a messenger RNA go? Ribosome. Right, ribosomes, ribosomes, right? So messenger RNA complexes with ribosomes. The ribosomes read that information. And then now we're going translation, right? And if you think about it in terms of language, like I've made the analogy so far, right? Now we're going from nucleic acid, right? RNA is nucleic acid to what are proteins made out of? What are proteins made out of? Amino acids, right? So this is nucleotides to amino acids to, that are proteins. So this is two different molecules, right? Two different molecule classes in our cells. So you can understand why they partly refer to it as translation, right? We're going from one type of molecule to another, just like in languages, right? From one language to another, we call that what? Translation. Right? So this, and then of course the, the proteins that we make, the polypeptides that we make, um, give rise to the organism's traits, what they look like, what they can do. This flow of information from DNA to RNA to proteins is referred to as the central dogma of genetics, or right, um, sometimes just referred to as the central dogma. So just diagrammically, right, we have DNA that can be replicated but DNA that can be transcribed, right, into messenger RNA can then be translated into proteins. So that flow of information. So how do we separate these pieces, though, right? How do we know that that segment from here to here 
is a gene. So there are key sequences, right? Code in the DNA that separates sections from one another, separates genes from one another. So we have a beginning and an end. And so we have proteins that are going to recognize those regions, right? And we're going to, we're going to really get into the particulars of that. Actually making a transcript, right? Using that information in DNA and making a transcript, that's referred to as gene expression, right? So we're actually expressing it. We're using that information. So the first thing that we're going to look at and, and be able to do is describe the organization of a protein encoding gene and its messenger RNA transcript, right? So if we have a structural gene, right, that's encoding a protein, how are these organized? So there are important segments as it relates between the DNA and the messenger RNA. So the first thing we have are regulatory sequences. And as the name implies, right, they regulate whether that gene, whether that information is going to be expressed, whether it's going to be used. Okay. And so there are proteins usually that typically will bind to this particular region of the DNA. And they will regulate whether that is expressed or not. In order for expression to actually happen, what has to bind to the DNA to make the messenger RNA? What do you think? Well, what made DNA? We've got different numbers associated with this enzyme and different Greek letters, but the core name of this enzyme stays the same. Yeah, DNA polymerase. So guess what makes RNA? Yeah, look at y'all, that's easy. RNA polymerase. <laughs> right, so RNA polymerase, just like DNA polymerase, physically binds to the molecule, right, and wraps around it. The site at which that happens, and then it's going to actually start copying that information, transcribing that information, happens at a site we refer to as the promoter, right? So that's this section right here. And usually the regulatory sequence is right next to the promoter. Promoter, right? So that's where RNA polymerase binds. And we're going to start synthesizing, right? Right past that region. And then, of course, we've got to have an end, right? And that region of the DNA where it's going to stop synthesizing the RNA is called the terminator, right? Which is pretty easy, right? It's the end. Terminates. Now, for messenger RNAs, right, remember this is what is going to be translated by the ribosome. So, of course, the ribosome has to do what first? Bind to it. So, within that segment of the RNA that's made, there is again a sequence that the RNA within the ribosome is going to recognize within the RNA of the messenger RNA. Right? So, these codes recognize each other. That region is referred to as the ribosome binding site. That's really easy, right? It's where the ribosome binds. And it's going to be at the beginning. But it's not going to start translating that into protein right away. So first it binds, right, and then it's going to start moving along. And again, it grasps onto the messenger RNA. It's not going to start putting nucleotide, I mean, amino acids together until it reaches a specific code within the messenger RNA. And this is a three-letter code, and it's the same in prokaryotes and eukaryotes and all organisms, it is the code AUG. It is called the start codon. So, messenger RNA is read in groups of three nucleotides by the ribosome. 
So AUG is what we call a codon. It's three nucleotides. And it is the start codon. And it does code for an amino acid. They're going to put an amino acid in there. They're going to put methionine. And then it's going to keep reading that sequence in groups of three nucleotides. And we'll talk about that when we get to translation. And we've translated out that code. right? We know if you have these three nucleotides, like AUG, we know that's where the ribosome is going to start, and it's going to put methionine there. Right? If you have UUU, we know what amino acid is going to be put there. We know the code. We've broken the code, you could say. And it's the same code for all living organisms. And non-living viruses use the same code. Same code for viruses. Same translation. Okay. So that makes sense to you guys? And then, of course, the ribosome, believe it or not, actually needs to be told to stop. And there are three different stop, or three, three or four. Woo. I should know this. I think it's three. Different codons that, again, we know whenever the ribosome gets there, it stops. Why they have more than one stop, I don't know, but we do. <laughs> Only one start, but several stops. <laughs> Apparently, they're like us, right? They, they uh, need more than one stop signal. So one interesting difference, though, between prokaryotes like bacteria and eukaryotes like ourselves is that Remember, eukaryotes, what makes, what's the defining characteristic that makes a eukaryote a eukaryote versus a prokaryote like a bacteria? Yeah, what specific organelle that's membrane bound? The nucleus, right? And that's where the DNA is, right? For prokaryotes, no nucleus, right? DNA is basically within the cytoplasm. It kind of has its own little zone we call the nucleoid. Right? But it's not separated from the cytoplasm by membrane. So messenger RNA, it really makes sense why they call it that, because it literally becomes a message, for the most part, that travels out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. For bacteria, no traveling, right? No traveling needed. And so their RNA will be made coming off the DNA, and ribosomes will start attaching to it as it's being made. And the other thing is, is that they'll make more than one gene at a time. So for instance, if you want to digest a sugar, you may need several enzymes in that pathway to digest that sugar, right? So all those enzymes are all together in one region of the DNA. So they'll make a transcript and they'll keep going to the next gene, right? So you get this really long transcript coming off the DNA, and the ribosomes are going to bind at different points. I had a picture at one time, and I meant to search for it for you guys. I'll find it for next time after the test. And the ribosomes will bind at different sites, and they're producing different proteins. So that's what they mean by, when they say right here, polyintrinsic. Poly meaning what? many. So they'll actually produce a messenger RNA that has more than one gene on it. And it's all one long strip of, of messenger RNA. And like I said, ribosomes will start attaching even as the RNA is being made. They'll start attaching. Where for in our cells, they're going to make the transcript and typically it's for one protein. One messenger RNA and it's going to travel out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm or maybe the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Right, because it has ribosomes attached to it. And that's where the protein is going to be made. So that's a major difference between uh, prokaryotes like bacteria versus eukaryotes like ourselves. Um, right, specifically starts. And then, of course, the end. Right? So each one of them has a beginning and an end. Right? But here it's referred to in the DNA as a promoter and a terminator. It's a start and stop codon for the messenger RNA. And then, of course, there are specific places where the enzymes are going to bind. It's the promoter region is where the binding actually is going to happen. And it's the ribosome binding site where the ribosome will bind. So that one's really easy because it has the name of the, 
what's going to copy it, right? So the other interesting thing is, is DNA is double-stranded, right? Hmm. But RNA is what? Single-stranded. And so do we need both strands of the DNA to make an RNA? No, we just need one strand. And interestingly enough, it can be the top or the bottom depending on how it's set up. And we'll look at that in the DNA. But just like DNA polymerase, what direction does it have to go in? Does RNA polymerase go in? 5 prime to 3 prime. But remember the two strands are anti-parallel to each other? They go in opposite directions? So go, guess what happens when RNA polymerase binds? It's got to go 5 prime to 3 prime. So if it binds to the top strand, it'll go in one direction. If it binds to the bottom strand, it goes in the other direction. Because the enzyme can only catalyze 5 prime to 3 prime. Okay. But we don't have to worry about copying both strands like we do in replication of DNA, right? So we can just pick a strand, but the strand we pick is going to it's going to determine what direction it goes in. And again, we don't have to worry about direction per se because we're not making two complete copies. It isn't the problem that we deal with when we do DNA replication. So we have names for these things, of course, right? We've got to name everything. So the strand that's actually used as the template, right? that they're going to copy the code from is called the template strand. The one that is not the template is either the non-template strand or sometimes it's referred to as the coding or sense strand. So coding meaning it's the same, it's going to end up being the same code as the messenger RNA. Right, so if you were to compare the DNA to the messenger RNA it would be the same except what? What's the difference? If I gave you a code of DNA and I gave you a code of RNA, how would you know unless I told you which one was RNA and which one was DNA? One has thymine, and who is the one that has thymine? DNA. And one has uracil instead of thymine, and that is RNA. Right? So other than that one switch, right, it would be if the, um, here, let me find a picture with a code. Here's one. So if the code, right, in the RNA is U, U, G, A, C, A, then did they use this strand? No, it used this strand to make it, right? So if the code I give you matches up with the DNA, that's the coding strand, right? Except for switching out the T's for the U's. <coughs> the template strand is opposite of that, right? Somewhat makes sense? So sense, speaking of sense, right? Codons are said to be sense codons, which actually code for amino acids, or non-sense codons, and guess what those tell the ribosome to do? Stop. So again, that's why it's called sense, um, the sense strand, because of that terminology that we use for codons. So coding, sense strand, or non-template strand is going to be the same code, except for that switch for the T's and the U's, as the messenger RNA. Transcription factors. So proteins will recognize the promoter and regulatory sequences. So they literally physically bind to those sequences in the DNA. Right? And they're going to control whether transcription happens for that gene or, or group of genes in the case of um, bacteria. And then in the RNA, as we said, there are specific sequences where the ribosome will bind. And then the codons themselves, those group of three nucleotides, determine what amino acids actually get put. So there are three stages of transcription. The beginning, the middle, and the end, right? Kind of. <laughs> 
we call it initiation, elongation, right? Because we're making a nice long molecule, and then termination. So they all involve proteins that bind to DNA, right? Whether it be the enzyme or regulatory proteins or ones that are going to stop the process. All along the way, right, proteins are interacting with the DNA in specific ways. So the very um, important one for actually elongating and making the messenger RNA is, of course, RNA polymerase. So we initiate, we start, right, by it binding to the promoter sequence, the RNA polymerase. That binding is facilitated by one of the proteins that we're going to look at soon. And this helps separate the, the DNA. And when we look at the promoter site again, it's going to make sense as to why this region contains a lot of A's and T's, is what do we have to do to the two strands? We're going to pull them apart, right? So the enzyme can read the information, right, and generate the transcript. So notice this guy looks very similar, right, to DNA polymerase. He's grabbing on <coughs> to the actual DNA. So we're going to actually make it, right? That's the elongation process. And then we're going to get to a point where the sequence is going to indicate that we need to stop. And again, proteins um, sometimes are involved in terminating this association. <coughs> so what are the various functions of RNA transcripts? So most of the time we're making messenger RNA, right, from DNA that's going to be translated by the ribosome into a protein. That's 90% of all the genes in the genome are coding for proteins. Okay? They're the workhorses of our cells. They do most of the work, right? They're the enzymes that catalyze the reactions, and they're even structurally important proteins as well. The rest of them are RNAs. Um, and as I said, they are a functional product, right? They are a gene product. There's something made from DNA. But that's as far as it goes, right? It's just they make these RNAs directly from the DNA. So some examples um, are ribosomes themselves are actually made out of ribosomal RNA and protein. Remember uh, tamilarase that we talked about last time? It has RNA in it, right? <coughs> That protein complex has a strip of RNA in it that has the code that it's going to use to make the DNA. And remember that we talked about this being reverse transcriptase because you're going from RNA to DNA where normally we're going DNA to RNA. So there, this, this enzyme actually goes in reverse. But it, the only reason it can do that is it has within it some RNA. That's the code that it uses to add the DNA to the ends of the DNA for linear chromosomes, what would happen to our chromosomes if we didn't have this enzyme complex that did this? <coughs> Over time, as we copied our DNA, what, happened, what would happen to it? It would get shorter. It would get shorter, right? We'd, and we'd eventually lose information. And in fact, cells' lifespans and how often they divide is determined by how much they have on their telomeres, how much DNA do they have at the end. As it starts to shorten, right, those cells will stop dividing. Because if they did divide, that you wouldn't have all the information. Um, spliceosomes are something that we're going to talk about later in this chapter. Um, again, enzyme complexes that contain RNA, right, and the RNA is crucial to their functioning. Others are used as signal recognition particles. So they help signal what's going to happen in the cell. Right? So here are some specific examples that we know about. Right? We're going to continue to talk about the messenger RNA, but transfer RNAs are also involved in the process of translation. Uh, and as their name implies, T stands for transfer. We abbreviate it. And they're literally going to transfer in, anyone know? 
So you have messenger RNA with the ribosome bound to it. And then along come these transfer RNAs, and they keep matching up with the messenger RNA in the ribosome complex. Why are they doing that? What are they bringing with them? They're bringing the amino acids, right? The transfer RNAs are actually what literally <coughs> transfer the amino acids in and match up that sequence within the ribosome complex. The ribosome itself contains RNA, right? And so, of course, because it's part of the ribosome, we call it ribosomal RNA, and we abbreviate that type of RNA with a little r. Um, and, the, and again, that's key to its functionality of being able to bind to the messenger RNA, right? Recognizing that code. MicroRNAs are short, as the name implies, right? Micro, small. They're short RNAs that are involved in gene regulation, and we found these in eukaryotes. Um, and I don't know if we're going to, I don't think we're going to talk about them this semester. Uh, small cytoplasmic, so of course they're found in the cytoplasm, right? Hence their name, abbreviated SC, have been found in both bacteria and eukaryotes. And they help target proteins to the endoplasmic reticulum. So these could be considered signaling RNAs, right? Where they're going to help send the messenger RNA to the endoplasmic reticulum. Um, in eukaryotes, anyways, because remember, prokaryotes don't have an endoplasmic reticulum. So it's some type of, you know, directing where these, these things need to go, though. And then we have another enzyme complex. So the RNA that's within the RNAsP enzyme, right? Um, this is an enzyme that um, I don't tell us here. Oh, right there. Um, it's necessary in making transfer RNAs. So this is an enzyme that helps in um, the proper formation of the transfer RNA with the amino acid, right? So the transfer RNA is made, but then you got to add the amino acid on, right? And so these basically you could say load up the, the transfer RNAs <laughs> with their amino acids. Uh, the small nuclear, again, within the nucleus, so um, eukaryotic. And these are part of... a a spliceosome, which is an enzyme um, that uh, makes changes to uh, messenger RNA. So we'll talk about that later in this chapter. We've already talked to me about tamylerase and how it works, and as we said, part of how it works is the RNA sequence that it uses to make the DNA to add the ends on to the telomeres. Small nucleolar RNAs um, are necessary in processing ribosomal RNA um, transcripts within the uh, nucleolus. Um, that's a region within the nucleus of, the, of a eukaryote that makes just huge amounts of ribosomal RNA. So there's so much of that being made in that region that it, it forms a characteristic region. It's not membrane bound, but there is a characteristic region <laughs> that forms within the nucleus from so many um, ribosomal RNA being produced within the nucleus. That's referred to as a nucleolus. So they found that these other additional small nuclear RNAs are involved in that process um, of making the ribosomal RNAs. And then as I mentioned earlier, right, some viruses are made actually of just um, RNA, not DNA. But that RNA can be read by our cells, right, when they get infected by an RNA virus, the exact same way we read our own RNA, right? They're, they're going to use that code and translate it into the proteins, except in this case, viral proteins, right, not our proteins. It's the same code. So, of course, most of what we know um, is from studying E. coli and specifically the viruses that infect E. coli, what are referred to as bacterial phages. And these are DNA viruses um, that infect um, E. coli. So they talk about a few of the important people involved in helping us in the understanding 
of this process in your book. But the good news is that I'm done making you guys memorize people's names. <laughs> There's a whole list, like in two paragraphs in the book. I'm like, oh Lord. Yeah, we're not doing that. Okay. Although they're important and we say thank you, right? We're not going to say thank you by memorizing them. So we've mentioned this promoter, right, briefly, but let's go into the details of it now, right? So how is it, and, and specifically, we're gonna, like I said, mo most of what we know is from bacteria. So we're going to look at the properties of a bacterial promoter. So as the name implies, it promotes, right? It allows this process of transcription to happen. It promotes it. And they're usually... Um, just upstream, right, of the sequence that's actually going to be transcribed. So there's a numbering system that we use for the basis for a gene segment. So where transcription actually starts, so this is going to be the first base transcribed, and notice they put an A here, so which strand is the template strand? <coughs> the bottom one, right? If it's the same, that's the coding strand. In this case, it's a, it's the, um, the template is the T, which is kind of funny. T, you know, just coincidence. <laughs> um, and because, right, if you look at the orientation of this template strand, right, five prime to three prime, in order to synthesize a molecule, right, 5 prime to 3 prime, it has to go in this direction. Did y'all see that? Okay. And so in front of it, what we call upstream, is where the promoter region is. And so this is where the RNA polymerase actually binds. And so they found that there is a sequence about 10 base pairs back from the start of transcription. <coughs> so right this space between here and here is about 10 base pairs. And so the numbering that we use is negative, right? So as in that we're going in the opposite direction. There's no zero though, right? So we go from one positive to negative one, right? And then, and then there's a, a gap here Right, depending on how long this sequence is. So right here, they're showing one, three, four, five, six. Right, so six plus eighteen is what? That's thirty-five. Right. Yeah. So at about thirty-five, so starting right here is thirty-five minus thirty-five. There's another sequence here. They're showing it's it's about again six nucleotides long, that's the other sequence that the proteins are actually interacting with. And so when you think about DNA, remember it's double-stranded, right? And and we we talk about, and last time I had found that one um, animation that I found, you really see the major and minor grooves. Where do you think these sequences are? Major <coughs> groove or minor groove? which is bigger, major groove. So therefore bigger, more space for proteins to insert in and interact. So it makes sense that there's a space of about 16 to 18 base pairs here because that's the minor groove section where the proteins aren't interacting. So I was trying to think, yeah. Okay, so this, um, sequence that's in the minus 10 region is sometimes referred to as the prim, <coughs> prim, now, prim now box and of course named after the guy who discovered it. But what you really should notice here is look at, it's all A's and T's, right? There isn't a single G and C. And for several of the gene segments these are all promoters for different genes, right? So for this is for the LAC operon. This is um, what controls the transcription of the enzymes necessary to digest lactose, right, in E. coli. Um, this is another um, one for uh, lactose. 
This is one for making tryptophan. Um, I don't know the rest of them though. This is um, one for making the transfer RNA that um, tyrosine binds to, right? That particular transfer RNA. When you look at all the sequences, what's the most common one you see in this first spot? T, right? And then if you were to look in the next spot, it would be T again, and then G and A and then C and then A. So for this minus 35, this is what we call a consensus sequence the most common nucleotides you find in that sequence, in that region. And you'll see that for the most part, although there's some G's and C's scattered in here, right? For the most part, they're predominated by A's and T's in this particular region. Which makes sense because it's closest to the start, right? Where we're going to actually start. And this is the number of um, nucleotides in between the start right, and this um, sequence that's being recognized by the proteins. So how does it actually transcribe, right? So the first thing it has to do is actually bind. And that enzyme, just like DNA polymerase, is made of lots of different subunits, right? We're not going to be memorizing the different ones, but one important one specifically is the sigma factor, this particular protein that complexes with RNA polymerase. Because this one has sections where the protein is helical, right? So just like DNA is helical, so can proteins be helical, right? So those amino acids arrange in a helices. So they have two sets of helices and then a section that's not helical that actually turns. So when you see it complexing with the DNA, it looks something like this. And then notice, as I said earlier, that this part of the protein, this alpha helix, is in the major group of the DNA. And that's where that sequence is that it's interacting with. And then the other part is on the other major groove on the other side here of the DNA. Right, and there's the turn, there's the piece that, co that connects the two alpha helixes. So this is specifically recognizing the promoter. Right, the sigma factor, that protein subunit of RNA polymerase is literally physically binding to and recognizing the sequence of the major groups. So sometimes that um, Prinbao <coughs> Uh, box is sometimes also referred to as the tat tat box. That's T A T T T A tat ta, right? T, right? So we're just pronouncing it as if it's some type of word. Not really, but <laughs> it's not really a word, right? But we pronounce it like a word. Just like people say MRSA. MRSA is not a word, y'all. It's an acronym M R S A. <laughs> uh, but we try to pronounce them as if they're words. I guess it makes it easier than saying M-R-S-A, right? MRSA. Pronouncing this is important. Okay, so um, once that complexes, so you have this complex, it's sliding along the DNA, and when the sigma factor actually binds to that promoter sequence, that minus 35 and minus 10, that consensus sequence, then um, transcription can happen and the sigma factor is actually released. Okay, And then it's going to continue on down, right, copying that code from the template strand. And again, that's going to determine the direction of which way this goes and which strand it, it will actually read. So again, remember, coding strand or sense strand or non-template strand. So guess what? Sometimes that template strand is referred to as the anti-sense strand as well. And again, anti meaning what in this case? What do you think? So if the sense strand is the code, 
not the code, or in this case, the opposite, right? Anti-sense is the opposite of the sense, right? Or complementary in the case of what we are used to, right? Complementary base pairing. So we know the code, right? A's with um, T's in DNA, but A's with what in RNA? U's, right? We switch out the T for a U. So this guy can go pretty fast, just like we've seen with DNA polymerase. It could add about 43 nucleotides per second, right, as it's going along. So this region, remember I said it makes sense that there's a lot of A's and T's within that uh, promoter region. They're not showing it here, though, are they? No, it already started. This is further back. I'll zoom in on it here. So, but we've got to separate these two strands. So why do we have a lot of um, A's and T's versus G's and C's? in this sequence right here. Where is that sequence? Why is there all A's and T's for the most part? Mostly A's and T's. What's the difference between the binding between A's and T's and G's and C's? Make the DNA only and also it's a dihydrogen bond. Di, I guess you could say dihydrogen. There's two, di meaning two, right? Hydrogen bonds between A's and T's, right? How many between G's and C's in DNA? Hydrogen bonds, three. So what's easier to pull apart, a segment of A's and T's or G's and C's? A's and T's, right. And I think we'll stop there because I want to do the activity. Yeah. And so this is, I think I, did I fast forward to this one earlier? I don't think I, I did. So remember again, partly what's, one strand is going to be the template strand, the other one is the non-template, right, or sense and anti-sense or coding and non-coding, depending on which terminology you use. You'll see that our book tends to prefer the template, right, but you need to be aware of the other terms that are used. So notice for this one, the promoter is in front here, so that kind of lets you know that it's going to go in this direction, but right, because there's a terminator, here's promoter terminator, so it's going to go in this direction. So that means which strand is it reading, the top or the bottom, right? So the polymerase polymerizes and makes the molecule 5' prime to 3'. prime. So it has to be the strand that's in the other direction that it's reading. So notice it's the bottom strand here that's labeled the template, right, 3 to 5. Where look at this gene. The promoter's here and the terminator's here, so he's going the other way. And which strand is, is the template strand in this case? The top one. The top one. Make sense? Okay. So it doesn't, you know, it's kind of weird. It's kind of mixed up. <laughs> Stuff goes in different directions. <laughs> it's weird. Okay. In that 